From Phoenix, Arizona, the Q at Catalyst Conference. Here's your host, Jeff Frick. Hey, welcome back, everybody. Jeff Frick here with the Q. We are on the ground in Phoenix, Arizona, at the Girls in Tech. Catalyst Conference, a great little conference, about 400 people. It's going to be 600 next year, I think, back in the Bay Area. It's their fourth year. We're really coming down and seeing what's going on. It seems to be a hotbed of women in tech issues here in Phoenix. We were here two years ago for our first Grace Hopper Conference, um, and so we're excited to come down and, and get a feel. And our next guest, Laura Williams, welcome. Thank you. So you are, uh, as we said off camera, you're the lone kind of government representative. You're the e-diplomacy officer at the U.S. Department of State. Right. So... First off, what is e-diplomacy? E-diplomacy uh, was founded by Secretary of State Colin Powell. Um, I actually started on the same day as he did at the State Department. We took different cars to work that day, but uh, I was a new hire when he was coming on as Secretary of State, and he um, very quickly identified that State Department needed a tech upgrade. Um, but he also combined that with uh, a culture upgrade. He said, you know, it's not just about needing new technology, but it's needing new technology that allows us to collaborate. And he sort of blew people's minds when he said, you know, it's not about need to know anymore, it's about need to share. Um, State Department still is a very bureaucratic, uh, you know, sort of hierarchical culture. Um, so this initially didn't, didn't rest so well. People said there's no way you know, um, w the first thing that e-diplomacy did was to bring in a wiki into the internal part of the State Department's network. And I said, well, that'll never work. We're a clearance culture and all of this stuff. We have 22,000 uh, Diplopedia articles, um, you know, running now. So uh, it, it did work. Uh, we brought blogs into um, the department in order to uh, tell stories across bureaucratic and geographical divides. I mean, if you think of the State Department, there's, um, we're, we're working in 190 countries, and we have 275 offices spread throughout those countries. So we needed collaboration. We needed technology like this. So that's really interesting, coming from Colin Powell, you know, the, the head of the Joint Chiefs, yep. Chiefs, right? Just got off a war, um, going into the State Department, which still today there's issues on, you know, Hillary's emails and this and that. It uh -huh. is a culture of of need to know. So how did that barrier break down? Did yeah. it have like the security overlay on the yeah. wiki? Did, yeah. did everything kind of happen, you know, outside or at some kind of grade level in terms of clearance so that it yeah. could, it could yeah. kind of spread? That's really yeah. an well, interesting two, story. Two things. Um, first of all, uh, when Colin Powell came to the State Department, most people didn't even have the internet on their desktop. It was probably... This is in 2001. Probably a security. Was yeah. it a security thing or just Well, that's lazy what everybody said. That's what everybody said, is it right? Security? Everybody said, we can't do that. It's not secure. Right. Well, Colin Powell, right, the guy who knows all about security, also happened to be on the board of AOL, right? And so he knew technology and he knew that you could make it secure. It's not like the Department of Defense didn't have access to the internet. He said, yeah, you got to make it secure. So we're talking about hardening the department's internal network um, and adding access to it, but of course adding uh, a layer of security on top of it. So he, it took that kind of leadership, that personality to come in and say, oh yes, we will do this and you all need to figure out how to do it, but, but we that, will do that's this. That's nothing compared to the cultural change though, right? The to cultural get people change to is the hardest, right. So was there a couple of people that just were wildly successful? I mean, how, again, yeah. Yeah. it's a, complete mind yeah, shift. Yeah, I think that we haven't been totally successful, even all these years later, 15 years later. There are definitely people that do not contribute to Diplopedia. There are people that Diplopedia. definitely uh, believe that uh, information is power and they would rather share less than more. Um, but if you look at the world around you today, and State Department does a lot of that, right? It's right, our job right. to interact with people. Um, even that business of diplomacy has changed. It is no longer the Secretary of State meeting with uh, the foreign minister of another country. Well, of course that happens and, and treaties are made, but all of us now are expected to perform diplomacy. It's people to people diplomacy, not just envoy to envoy. And how do we do that? How do we do that on a massive scale? 
Technology, right. of course. Technology is a big part of well, that. Well, how do you do it with all the people that you're not interacting with at work? I mean, right. that's what we see over and over is the consumerization of IT, right? Yeah. And the expected behavior of things yeah. at work to behave like they are when I'm not working. I'm, I yeah. wonder if as some of the yeah. younger people have come in yeah. to the government, like, of what? Of course, we, why, why don't right. you have these things? It's you know? an awesome source of friction. <laughs> <laughs> Can I say that? I mean, uh, it is definitely a friction. Um, like every other CIO of, of an organization as large as the State Department's, um, there is, is a constant worry about security, a constant worry about being able to manage a diverse tool set. But if you don't provide the technology that your organization needs, you're going to create even bigger security problems. You're going to have a shadow IT. Right. Um, people are going to start using their personal Gmail accounts instead of their state.gov accounts. So we need to find ways to bring uh, collaborative technology and technology that we use every day in our personal lives inside the safety of, of our network so that people have the kind of tools they need to do their jobs. That's great. We, we, we interviewed uh, Michelle K. Lee, who's the Undersecretary of Commerce at the USPTO office. Um, she came from Google. So again, another one of these kind of moves from, mm -hmm. from the, uh, the tech world into the government. But let's shift gears a little bit. Um, why are you here? What were you talking about here at this conference? Right. So um, first of all, I've learned so much from being at this conference. Uh, you know, I was a little bit unsure when um, Adriana, the, the CEO of, of uh, Girls in Tech, you know, invited me to, to talk. As, as you mentioned at the outset, I'm the only Govy here. <laughs> so I thought, like, how is my story going to really resonate with the women that are present? And um, I spoke today, yesterday, uh, story after story, presenter after presenter, I, I felt more and more confident. And I said, oh my goodness, the, the challenges are the same in private sector. They're the same if you're at a startup or um, you know, a big fancy company like, like Intel or IBM. Uh, a lot of the stories are the same if you're in government. So I'm just gonna you know, be authentic and tell my story. Um, so we did two things. We talked about you know, IT innovation in, in government at the federal level and how President Obama has invited uh, you know, West Coast high-speed, low-drag people to come uh, help us fix our, our, our uh, IT systems. Um, but then I talked about my story. Um, I had a degree in international relations. Um, but moved out of that field in the mid-90s when it seemed like everybody was doing something with tech. Uh, you know, it was, it was an uncomfortable move at first because, you know, I, I was really wedded to, well, I've studied international relations, I should be in this business. But I had one of those post-collegiate bubble-bursting experiences where, you know, I was working at USAID and I thought, I don't know, this, the theory that I learned in school doesn't seem to be playing out in the field. Um, and I shared an office with the IT guy, right? Oh, he was so annoying, you know? <laughs> but, uh, it's funny how things work out. Right, you know, so a few months later, he, uh, he you know, called me up. He said, hey, you still thinking about a career change, right? Three years out of college, we have careers, right? So I said, yeah, actually I am. And he said, well, I'm in a different embassy every month. We're unplugging the old computer system, putting a new one in, and we need you. And I said, I don't know anything about tech. And he said, but you know about the business. You've studied interna international relations. You are a people person. We need somebody who can relate to people, who can uh, sit in a meeting with the ambassador and explain to him, you know, what, what, what the importance, you know, the importance of this uh, tech rollout and explain it in plain language, not in, in dorky tech talk, and then we'll teach you the dorky tech talk after hours. I ended up really liking it. I liked that if there was a problem, I could fix it. Um, and that has led to a career in the State Department where I'm certainly in between the org chart. Uh, the, the hardcore zero and one techies, they don't consider me a techie. The international relation majors that are doing the business of diplomacy, they're like, well, you're not one of us either. But uh, I've made a sweet spot out of uh, being in between the org, org chart, and, and uh, it's really worked out for me. It's, it's such a great story on, on, on so many levels. One, because you, you are still in international relationships. Yes, you work very in the much State so. Department. Yeah. It doesn't get much more international very relationships much so. than that. Yeah. But you found your own niche, and, and yeah. I, I think a really important lesson um, 
for people considering a career in tech, you don't necessarily have to be a hardcore techie. You don't right. have to know coding to get a yeah. job and get yeah. paid to to play in this really fun and exciting and, and rapidly moving world. Yeah, that's true. Uh, there have been a lot of stories here over the past couple of days about that. There's a lot of people in that room that do not have a degree in engineering or computer science. And in fact, um, you know, I, I got to a place in my career where I stopped being shy about being that person who spoke both tech and international relations and said, you know, um, in the State Department, you change your assignment every couple of years. So you're constantly sort of lobbying or bidding for a new job. And I went to apply for um, a job in the Operations Center. That's the 24-7 nerve center of the State Department where we alert and brief uh, the Secretary of State and other officials on, on events around the world. And the guy interviewing me, who would later become my boss, said, you know, you're not a traditional candidate for this job. But by this point in my career, I said, that's right. And that is exactly why I'm the best person for this job, because I have this blend of skills that's going to take this place to the next level. So, um, And you got the job. I got the job. And we changed the way, you know, the department receives, you know, alerts and, and briefs um, about events that are happening all around the world. Awesome. Yeah. Well, congratulations. Thanks. Great story and, and, and really great inspiration for people looking for a good story. Yeah. So I Thank appreciate you. you taking a few minutes out of your time representing the government, representing the State Department here at the conference. And thanks for stopping by the Cube. Thanks so much. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. All right, Laura Williams, I'm Jeff Frick. You're watching the Cube. We are at the uh, Girls in Tech Catalyst Conference. Thanks for watching.